some of Yeats's lyrics, such as Meditations in Time of Civil War, 1919, Easter 1916, and The Tower, have epic qualities. They record historical events, and in them, Yeats was using the mask of a national poet. In poems or lyrics, such as The Second Coming, No Second Troy, Sailing to Byzantium, and Byzantium, we discover him as a lyric poet in his most concentrated and distilled best. These are some of the best examples of lyric poetry in the entire range of English literature. Sailing to Byzantium was written after Yeats had visited Ravenna, where he went to the baptistries there and saw some of the relief art in the baptistry on the ceiling and the walls. Byzantium became a symbol of Yeats, which he considered to be purely given to art as against the mundane daily life of people elsewhere. Let's read the poem Sailing to Byzantium. That is no country for old men, the young in one another's arms, birds in the trees, those dying generations at their song, the salmon falls, the mackerel crowded seas, fish, flesh or fowl commend all summer long, whatever is begotten, born and dies. Caught in that sensual music, all neglect, monuments of an aging intellect. That is no country for old men. The Celtic word for paradise is the country for young men. And yet, even while deriding Ireland, remember the poem was written in 1926 and published in October blast of 1927. Later, it became the first poem, the introductory poem of the tower. By that time, Yeats had already become a public figure. He had won the Nobel Prize for Literature. He was a member of the newly formed Irish Senate and he was known to all Irishmen. That is no country for old men and he is talking about Ireland. He is unhappy about the gains of independence. Ireland instead of becoming a great nation is showing signs of becoming a bigoted nation, a nation that is divided and a nation that is being directed by narrow-minded religious fanatics. That is no country for old men, the young in one another's arms, birds in the trees, those dying generations at their song. Birds have often been represented as concupiscent creatures. Birds in the trees, those dying generations at their song, the salmon falls, the mackerel crowded seas. He is giving you one image after another of procreation, of breeding, in which Yeats finds himself out of place. He 
as an old man feels that he cannot procreate. He cannot be like the young boys and girls going hand in hand any longer. And so he wants to leave Ireland and go away to Byzantium. Fish, flesh or fowl commend all summer long, whatever is begotten, born and dies. Caught in that sensual music all neglect, monuments of an aging intellect. And what do young men and women do? They neglect great things of life. Yet, in a, pu in a purely tongue-in-cheek manner, is talking about greatness on the one hand and the sensual life on the other as in opposition, which he did not actually believe in. Caught in that sensual music all neglect, monuments of an aging intellect. You can do great things. You can be a great artist, a great statesman. That is what he is saying, but I don't think that Yeats actually believed in that. An aged man is but a paltry thing, a tattered coat upon a stick, unless soul clap its hands and sing and louder sing, for every tatter in its mortal dress, nor is there singing school but studying monuments of its own magnificence, and therefore I have sailed the seas and come to the holy city of Byzantium. An aged man is but a paltry thing, a tattered coat upon a stick. You find this image again in among school children. An aged man is but a paltry thing, a tattered coat upon a stick. A tattered coat upon a stick may look like a man. An old man also, Yeats feels, may look like a man, but he is not one. Again, Yeats is speaking with a tongue-in-cheek manner. He some, some, uh, when, when asked what uh, sailing to Byzantium was, he once said that it is it's an extremely sexual poem, sexual, he used the word sex. And notice he is sort of complaining about lack of sexual urge that he finds in himself. An aged man is but a paltry thing, a tattered coat upon a stick, unless soul clap its hands and sing and louder sing. For every tatter in its mortal dress, nor is there singing school but studying monuments of its own magnificence. What is he doing? Earlier he had suggested that we neglect monuments of an aging intellect. And here he is carrying further the idea monuments of its own magnificence, nor is there singing school but studying monuments of its own magnificence. So, a tatter, uh, an old man, what should an old man do? Instead of wishing to be loved by or, or to love others, he should pray to God. Yes, did not quite believe in that. Soul clap its hands and sing and louder sing. For every tatter in its mortal dress, nor is there singing school but studying monuments of its own magnificence. And therefore I have sailed the seas and come to the holy city of Byzantium. Notice the rhyme between come and Byzantium. You may have noticed that this poem is in Ottawa Rima. That is, it rhymes, it is, it is in eight line stanzas, four eight line stanzas, quite concentrated, quite powerful, quite distilled. And you have the rhyme scheme as A, B, A, B, A, B, C, C. An aged man is but a paltry thing, a tattered coat upon a stick, unless soul clap its hands and sing and louder sing, for every tatter in its mortal dress nor is there singing school, but studying monuments of its own magnificence. And therefore, I have sailed the seas and come to the holy city of Byzantium. Notice the lack of a definite article 
before soul which necessitates the emphasis soul clap its hands you have to emphasize the word soul here an aged man is but a paltry thing a tattered coat upon a stick unless soul clap its hands it's, it's a carry uh, run on line unless soul clap its hands and sing and so naturally as the head word of the line the soul gains emphasis soul clap its hands and sing and louder sing for every tatter in the mortal dress nor is there singing school but studying monuments of its own magnificence and therefore i have sailed the seas and come to the holy city of byzantium he is describing in a way the baptistries at in ravenna and he and the, the baptistries are musical places so notice in the first stanza you have the word music caught in that sensual music all neglect notice the poignancy with which yeats refers to human sexuality he is calling it sensual music he is not calling it cacophony he is call not calling it noise he is not calling it a blast he is not calling it something that disturbs human beings even while he is saying that caught in that sensual music all neglect monuments of an aging intellect there is this opposite movement in the poem on the one hand he is on the surface telling you don't waste your time on sex don't waste your time on showing too much attraction for the other sex and at the same time he is describing sensuality as musical in the second stanza he goes on and says soul clap its hands and sing so you have this musical new element of music throughout the poem because it is about the baptistries in ravenna an aged man is but a paltry thing a tattered coat upon a stick unless soul clap its hands and sing and louder sing for every tatter in the mortal dress nor is there singing school but studying monuments of its own magnificence and therefore i have sailed the seas and come to the holy city of byzantium and thereafter in the third stanza he goes on to make an appeal to the sages standing on the walls o sages standing in god's holy fire as in the gold mosaic of a wall come from the holy fire burn in a jar and be the singing masters of my soul consume my heart away sick with desire and fasten to a dying animal it knows not what it is and gather me into the artifice of eternity what is this somewhat strange stanza o sages standing in god's holy fire as in the gold mosaic of a wall there was a lot of gold work in in fact there is a lot of gold work done on the mosaic of the wall which when the baptistry is lighted glow like fire so these sages are seen as if they were in fire o sages standing in god's holy fire as in the gold mosaic of a wall come from the holy fire burn in a jar and be the singing masters of my soul what is he saying he is saying you come down from the wall burn in a jar as it were go round and round and round and gather me and take me lift me up and place me among yourselves 
I wish to be part of you on the wall. In the whole poem, Yeats is being ironical. He was not one, he was not such a religious man who would wish to be part of the saints on the walls. O sages standing in God's holy fire, and as in the gold mosaic of a wall, come from the holy fire, burn in a gyre, and be the singing masters of my soul. Consume my heart away, sick with desire, and fasten to a dying animal, it knows not what it is. Consume my heart away, sick with desire. Notice, earlier he had said that he is like a tattered coat upon a stick. Now he says his heart is sick with desire. And it is this desire that Yeats holds as something noble and great. Yeats always talked about the athletic man. Yeats always held that uh, the original act, the enunciatory act of Zeus, his copulation with Leda was the defining moment in the history of the West for the first 2000 years, which ended with the advent of Christ during the reign of Augustus in Rome. So Yeats is talking about the, the physical body and its music. O sages standing in God's holy fire, come as in the gold mosaic of a wall, come from the fire, come from the holy fire, burn in a gyre and be the singing masters of my soul. Consume my heart away, sick with desire, and fasten to a dying animal, it knows not what it is, and gather me into the artifice of eternity. In one of his letters to Olivia Shakespeare, Yeats wrote that the image of entering the fire that he had seen in Blake's illustration of Dante and then the consumption of when he says consume my heart away how do you do what is consuming it's burning Bur here it means burning and where did he get this image from Yeats told Olivia Shakespeare that he got it from Vanni Fuki Vanni Fuki was a thief and he stole some of the precious metals from a church and he divulged that it was stolen by some other accomplice of his and thus he got saved. Besides Dante portrays him as one who showed his thumb to, to, to God. The thumb was always seen as a symbol of the phallus and the two fingers were always seen as the, uh, as the symbol of vulva and this was the sign that he showed to God. And for this he was bitten by a snake. Bitten by a snake he got burnt. Vani Fuki got burnt and he was consumed by fi fire. He lost his body and from that body there appeared a new body of Vani Fuki. This is what Dante describes in his Inferno. Yeats told Olivia Shakespeare that it was from a medium that he learned that he should use those images in this poem. This is a difficult element to accept, but creative imagination is rich in itself and, and can handle such images on its own. There should not be much need of 
mediums to do these things. However, this was what Yeats thought about his use of these images. O sages standing in God's holy fire, and the, as in the gold mosaic of a wall, come from the holy fire, burn in a gyre, and be the singing masters of my soul. Consume my heart away, sick with desire, and fasten to a dying animal, it knows not what it is. Notice the use of the word knows not what it is, has an echo from the Bible. Jesus, when put on the cross, had said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And Yeats is writing, as it were, a religious poem. When he is thinking of sailing to Byzantium, he is thinking of devoting, even though superficially, devoting himself to a holy act. And so he says, and, and so he says, consume my heart away, sick with desire, and fasten to a dying animal, it knows not what it is. What is this body? Shankaracharya had said, kastum koham kut ayata. What, and, and this question has occurred again and again in all cultures. And fasten to a dying animal, it knows not what it is and gather me into the artifice of eternity. From a human being, Yeats wants to become an artifice. A little early on, he had said, consume my heart away, sick with desire and fasten to a dying animal. Was he thinking of the fires cleansing him and creating a new William Blake's uh, William uh, B. Yeats, probably that is the case. It knows not what it is and gather me into the artifice of eternity. And the last stanza, once out of nature I shall never take my bodily form from any natural thing but such a form as Grecian goldsmiths make of hammered gold or gold enameling to keep a drowsy emperor awake or set upon a golden bough to sing to lords and ladies of Byzantium of what is past or passing or to come. Once out of nature I shall never take my bodily form from any natural thing. Yet later on in his life was profoundly under the influence of theosophy and Hindu philosophy. And here he is t telling you about rebirth. He thinks that w when once he dies, he would be re reborn. And now what does he want to be reborn as? He does not want to be reborn as a human being. He wants to become a bird, a bird made by an artist, a craftsman. Once out of nature, I shall never take my bodily form from any natural thing, but such a form as Grecian goldsmiths make of hammered gold or gold enameling. He wants to become a golden bird, to set upon a golden bough of hammered gold and gold enameling, to keep a drowsy emperor awake, or set upon a golden bough to sing. Probably. Yeats got this image of a golden bird or gold enameling from Christian Andersen. Once out of nature, I, I shall never take my bodily form from any natural thing, but such a form as Grecian goldsmiths make of hammered gold or gold enameling to keep a drowsy emperor awake or set upon a golden bough to sing to lords and ladies of Byzantium of what is past or passing or to come. Notice the syntactical chime across the poem, the syntax that you find in of what is past or passing or to come in the fourth stanza and whatever is begotten, born and dies. 
there is a kind of syntactical parallel, a syntactic chime can be heard in this poem. The whole poem is a musical experience. The whole poem has many facets. The more you read it, the more you think about it, the more meaning you can gather from it of what is past or passing or to come. Notice the rhyme at the end once again of to lords and ladies of Byzantium of what is past or passing or to come. The rhyme being words Byzantium and come have been prefigured in the second stanza as and therefore I have sailed the seas and come to the holy city of Byzantium. The poem as it were turns upon itself and the poem does not have any definite meaning. Poems, Yeats thought, were not supposed to convey meaning. Poems were not articles or poems were not debates in the houses of parliament. Poems were meant to communicate experiences and sailing to Byzantium communicates an experience which probably cannot be named so easily, an experience of despair and an experience of hope, an experience of loss and an experience of gain, an experience of faithlessness and an experience of faith, an experience of devotion and an experience of debauchery for which you have examples in a poet such as Dunn or in India in a poet such as Vidyapati or Ghalib. You have both faith, you have both devotion and debauchery going hand in hand and that is the kind of poet Yeats is. Sailing to Byzantium is truly one of his greatest lyrics. Thank you.